John chapter 4, we're going to pick up at verse 46 and read to the end of the chapter. If you would read along with me and let us hear the Word of God together. John 4, beginning in verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where He had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when He had come out of Judea into Galilee. Amen. May God bless the reading of His Word. If you would, bow with me. Let us unite our hearts and seek God's help as we come to Him in the preaching of His Word. Let us pray together. Father, we thank You this morning for the blessed gift of Your Son, as we've just sung, how we have proved Your Son's faithfulness and love over and over again. Oh, for grace to trust Him more, Father. We ask that You would answer that prayer, hear our cries, that Lord, like this nobleman, this Father, we would be those who believe the Word of the Lord Jesus, that we would be those who believe and trust in the wisdom and the love of Christ for His church. Father, we thank You for this incredible account of the life that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That though we are filled with sickness and decay and death, in Christ there is pure life. And that life is the light of men that we so desperately need. And we pray that we would believe in Christ and have life in His name. Father, we pray for any who are here this morning who are strangers to Christ, who are still, even though they may not even realize it, dead in their trespasses and sins, that they are dead spiritually. We pray, Father, by Your Spirit, make them alive. Grant them new life from above. Grant them the gift of faith and repentance. That they would feel like this Father, their desperate need for the mercy of Christ and their need for Christ to have pity upon them. Father, do it for Your name's sake, Your glory's sake, we pray. Encourage us as Your church. Build us up in our most holy faith. Father, cause accounts like these and narratives like these not to become common to us, but that we would marvel at the incredible person that You have given to redeem us, Your Son. We pray, Lord, that we would have hearts that stand astounded at His grace to us in giving to us eternal life. Father, draw near to Your people, we pray. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're picking up. We will, Lord Lord willing, finish chapter 4 this morning. We've spent the bulk of our time in chapter 4 considering the Samaritan revival and Jesus' ministry to the woman at the well and the subsequent revival that comes from her faithful testimony to the town of Sychar. And now in this section, Jesus has departed from Samaria. He stayed there two days. And He continues on to His original destination. You remember from the beginning of chapter 4, which is Galilee. And here... He does, not receive, he does not receive as warm of a welcome as He did among the Gentile Samaritans, but John gives us the account of one father's journey 
from the pit of despair to the joys of redemption through Christ. And so let's begin with our exposition of the text and then we'll transition to our doctrine and application. And it's at this point especially I encourage you if you have a Bible to have it open to John 4 so that you can see what God is saying to us. We'll pick up our exposition in verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee where He had made the water wine. And so to introduce this narrative with this nobleman, John immediately draws our memories back to chapter 2 where Jesus first manifested His glory in this very same town. And the point of that is to remind us that while Samaria had but one occasion to see and hear the Lord Jesus, this is a people that was much exposed to the Savior. They had not only heard and seen what He did at the wedding at Cana, they had not only, according to verse 45, seen His signs which He did in Jerusalem during the Passover, but even now again and again, they have the light shining brightly among them, which is to their shame because of the ill reception that they give Him. Carrying on, he says, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Okay, now Capernaum is about a 15 mile journey from Cana. It's still in Galilee. And the word for nobleman here, or official, depending on the translation you have, is a word related to the word king. And it means one belonging to the king or one in service to the king. And this is very likely a reference to Herod Antipas, who was at this time tetrarch over the region of Galilee. And so that would indicate that this nobleman is a man of significant status in the world. And that is confirmed by the fact that in verse 51, he has servants who come out to greet him. And yet, the afflictions of the curse have seized upon his family. His son is sick. Now take note of that, Christian. That sickness and affliction and the afflictions of the curse are no respecter of persons in this life. From the lowest of the low in society to those who serve in king's palaces, none are exempt from the afflictions of the curse and the tyranny of the curse. And this nobleman, this official with all of his status and no doubt all of his connections to some of the best physicians of his day finds himself at a loss with his sick son who according to verse 7 is at the point of death. But as the Lord Jesus will say in John chapter 11, verse 4, this sickness does not lead to death but it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Verse 47, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Okay, so this father, despairing of what to do or what can be done, he hears Jesus of Nazareth has come from Judea and he's here in Galilee. Now, we don't know. Perhaps this man was there in chapter 2 at the feast during the Passover. Maybe he was one of those who saw Jesus' mighty works. Uh, Perhaps he's just one who has heard about His works. But whatever the case, sparing no pains, this father makes the 15-mile journey just to get an audience with the Lord Jesus. And we see something here about the character of this man in the honor and the respect that he pays to Christ. Many men of his status might have just sent a servant to go fetch Jesus. Or many men of his status would presume to have the authority to simply uh, command Jesus' attendance upon his son. But instead, this man leaves his sick son and he comes to Christ himself and he comes to Christ as a beggar. He comes imploring the Lord for help and pity and mercy. And we see something of a progression of this man's faith as as well as his faith being mixed with infirmity. First of all, notice that he is convinced that Christ is able to heal his son. 
I mean, you don't just take a 15-mile journey to go see someone that you have no confidence has the ability to do what you hope they can do. Even though other physicians had likely exhausted what they could do for the boy, and though his sickness is nearly to the point of death, the nobleman seeks out Christ believing his power to be superior to theirs. And yet, notice the infirmity. Notice he doesn't yet comprehend the extent of Christ's power. Notice twice he asks Jesus, come down and heal my son. He says that here in verse 47 and again in verse 49. He at least hopes that Christ can heal his son, but he's got limitations in his mind of Christ's ability and methods. And it seems he's saying to Christ, come, come with me just as other physicians would have to come to, with me and come and lay eyes on my son and lay hands on my son and examine him and, and heal him. That's very, very interesting. You contrast that with the faith of the centurion in Matthew 8, verse 8. He's a Gentile and the Lord offers the centurion I will go with you to your house and heal your servant. And when the centurion hears that, he says, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, among no one in Israel have I found such faith. But this nobleman here is not there yet. He needs to be taught by the Lord. And so verse 48, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now, perhaps Jesus knew that there was in this man a desire to see the miracle for himself with his own eyes. And I mentioned this last time, I'll mention it again. The you there is plural in Greek. Okay, it's not a singular you. And so while he is addressing this nobleman, and he's certainly included in this, he is not only reproving the nobleman, he's reproving this whole region. Like we saw last time, the Jews are by and large sign seekers, but they are not believing the words of Christ. And Christ here is reproving the current weakness of this nobleman's faith. But notice how the man simply continues on in his imploring and his begging. Verse 49, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He doesn't say a word about Christ's reproof. He neither confirms it nor denies it. But he doesn't take our Lord's reproof as an outright denial of his request. And this man, it seems, is just so taken up and overwhelmed with grief over his son that he can reply to the reproof with nothing but to repeat his request. Sir or Lord, come down and heal my son before he dies. He's begging the Lord, have pity. And though his perseverance with Christ is commendable, it seems here he reveals another infirmity in his mind, a limitation in his mind regarding Christ's power. He says, come down before my child dies. It seems that in his mind, death is that thing which even the greatest physicians on earth cannot reverse. And so verse 50, Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Though this father had his weaknesses, his misunderstandings, Christ, as we've seen his gentleness with the woman of Samaria, Christ doesn't take offense, but he pities this man. And he grants him his desire, but note, he grants him his desire not in the way the father expected or requested. Right? This man has, had set his hopes on Jesus coming back with him to see his son. And perhaps he even told his son as he left him, son, I'm coming back with help. But Jesus reveals his glory here in an even more astounding fashion. That he is not like other physicians. He is not bound by the ordinary means that the doctors of this earth are bound by. He doesn't go with him. He doesn't say a word. 
Nothing is ordered to be done by the man. The miracle is simply wrought. And here's the thing. In doing this, not only is Christ demonstrating His power beyond what this man believed possible, but at the same time, Christ is testing this man's faith. He's essentially putting the question to this man, will you believe Me without seeing Do you have faith enough to return to your house without Me? Believing that when I say it is done, it is done. And Jesus essentially says to him, go, it has been done, trust My Word, and go see your son for yourself. And so, John goes on, the man believed the Word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. This man is now walking by faith and not by sight. He believes, notice, the Word that Jesus spoke to him before his eyes see the proof. He he believes here not not only in the omniscience of Christ, believing that Christ knows that His Son has been made well, but he believes also in the omnipotence of Christ, believing that this miracle has been wrought by none other than Jesus of Nazareth. And that's amazing. The last time this father laid eyes on his son, he was at the point of death. Seeming, seemingly with no hope. But here at the Word of Christ, like Abraham, the father of the faithful, in hope he believed against hope. And he returns home. And then we see in verses 51 and 52 the further confirmation of his faith. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Now, you might read that initially and think that what's going on here is the father is asking this question because he's doubting whether his son really has recovered as a result of Christ's Word. And you might read that initially thinking that the Father is kind of inquiring like, uh, perhaps this is just a coincidence. Uh, Perhaps my son has just kind of gotten better by natural causes. But remember, John has already told us that this man believed the Word that Jesus spoke. So, that's not the way we should interpret this inquiry. This inquiry is not like Thomas. I've, I've hit on doubting Thomas, poor Thomas, a lot. This is not like Thomas, unless I see, I will never believe. Okay? Hear hear this. There's a difference between someone who demands proof in order to believe Christ's Word. There's a difference between that and someone who already believes the Word, seeking to understand the full extent of how the miracle was wrought. Okay? The Father, remember, wasn't there. He, He didn't see the miracle. And he's saying to his servants, tell me exactly how it happened. Tell me when and how suddenly my son recovered and then do I have something to tell you? Matthew Henry says, this is not as if he doubted the influence of Christ's Word upon the child's recovery, but he was desirous to have his faith confirmed that he might be able to satisfy any to whom he should mention the miracle. He's not investigating with an an unbelieving and doubtful heart. He's investigating with a believing heart seeking to confirm and comprehend what he already believed. And notice they say to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. This miracle was so instantaneous that they can pinpoint the hour. And remember, this was not solicited. The Father didn't kind of lead them on uh, saying, hey, yesterday at the seventh hour, a man told me such and such. That's probably when my boy started to get ready. uh, Started to get better, right? That's not what happened here. They, on their own, apart from any knowledge of what the Father has experienced, they witnessed such an extraordinary recovery in this boy that there was no doubt that they could say, at this hour, the fever left him. 
And I can imagine them saying something to this nobleman like, Sir, we cannot explain it. But the fever didn't just break and begin to go away by degrees. It vanished. And so verse 53, so the Father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Christ brought more to this household than this man even asked for. He brought eternal life. This temporal mercy Christ showed to this man and his son and his family led to a household of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says he believed. Before he at least believed something about Christ enough to visit him, and then he trusted the word of Christ concerning his son, and now his his faith is strengthened to a full assurance. And through this man's testimony, Right? I mean, his household didn't just believe for no reason. They believed because this man, like the woman of Samaria, became an evangelist to his household and told them, this is what the Lord has done for us. And as a result, his whole household becomes disciples. What a change the grace of our Lord brought to this household. What spiritual and eternal good this affliction brought to them. And John concludes with verse 54, this again is the second sign Jesus did when He had had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, that concludes our exposition. Let us turn our attention now to our doctrine and application. And I've combined these for us this morning for the sake of being a bit more brief than it would have been. And I have three things for us this morning. How, How does this text instruct us and apply to us? I have three things and I'll give them to you as we go. Number one, by way of doctrine and application, we are taught in this passage that in Jesus Christ is life. In Jesus Christ is life. This is a theme. One of the major themes in John's Gospel. He announced it in chapter 1, verse 4. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And he concludes his Gospel in chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have what? Life in His name. This sign which our Lord most graciously and sovereignly performed Giving life to this boy who is near the point of death is a demonstration that in Christ Jesus is the life that men need. Okay? Abundant, overflowing, never running dry life abides in the Son of God. And He shows us this, and He shows this Father this in a way that our feeble, carnal senses can understand. You think about it. This father was watching with his own eyes the physical life of his son going out from his son. And he saw how powerful death is when it comes to us. And then he sees by divine power that same life which was slipping away miraculously restored. This father sees that even fevers obey Christ. When Christ imparts life, they flee. I imagine this Father was somewhat like the disciples were in Mark 4 when Jesus calm, he rebukes the sea and He calms the storm. And it says that His disciples are just sitting in this boat and that they are filled with fear and they say to one another, who then is this? that even the sea and the wind obey Him. We'll see in chapter 11 that with Lazarus that death and the grave obey Christ. Okay, now, listen to me, Christian. This is the connection. That's amazing and gracious in and of itself. Even if that's all that Jesus ever came into this world to do. 
if all He came to do was to do some temporal good to sinners. But if that's all you see in this miracle, you haven't yet grasped the point of the miracle. This restoration of physical life to this boy's body is a sign directing sinners that in Christ there is a life to be had that goes beyond the body. A life that is eternal. Jesus says in chapter 5, verse 25, we'll get there, Lord willing, not too long. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And He's not talking about their physical resurrection. He goes on to describe physical resurrection later on in the chapter. He's talking about an hour that is already here in which spiritually dead sinners hear the voice of the Son of God and are rising to newness of spiritual life. By nature, we tend to think that our biggest problem is this physical body's decay and inevitable death. That's what tends to grab our attention most about our problem. And don't get me wrong, it was right for this father to have deep concern for the life of his son. But what we don't realize is that the reason this body is decaying and dying physically is because we have already experienced a much more fundamental death. Namely, spiritual death. We have all in our first father, Adam, fallen from the heights of communion and fellowship with God through sin, and we have become God's enemies. From the moment of conception, without exception, we are all born children of darkness and children of wrath, dead spiritually. And here's the thing, if we don't get that problem fixed, There is a much worse death coming for us after our physical death. Jesus says to us that He came that we should have life and have it abundantly. And yes, that includes never-ending physical life in the eternal state. In the new heavens and the new earth. But having and possessing that life is tied to first experiencing the life of Christ within you now by grace through faith. He said to Martha in John 11 after Lazarus Lazarus had died, He said to her, Whosoever believes in Me, though he die, yet shall he live. How can He say that? He can say that because the life Christ gives transcends physical life. Because Christ has lived for me and died for me and risen for my justification, I am alive, alive in Him who is my living head. Non-Christian, you who are currently presently outside of Christ, I want to speak to you. The glorious promise of the Gospel to you is that today, this very moment, you can have the hope of knowing that if this body gives up this afternoon, and if I sleep the sleep of death, I go directly to Christ my Lord and I enter into a life like I cannot even begin to imagine. And the Gospel promises you that you can have confidence that when I die, when my eyelids close in that sleep of death, I will cross the Jordan and I will enter the promised land where my God dwells. Where the Lamb sits in all His glory. And I have confidence that upon arriving, He will hand me a white garment knitted with His own righteousness. And He will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. Non-Christian, I pray you would become jealous to be a Christian. 
jealous to have that kind of hope and assurance, you will one day find yourself at death's door. That could be years from now. That could be this afternoon. Only, okay, only having the life of Christ within you and having the assurance that I am at peace with God will enable you to walk through that door with a calm assurance and even an eager expectation of what awaits you on the other side. It is my genuine hope and prayer and desire that none of you should meet death kicking and screaming and fearful of what awaits you on the other side but rather that you would meet death as it were with arms stretched forward saying, Lord, give me the prize. I have drunk of your love and your life from the streams down here below, but now, Lord, it is time. Let me drink more deeply above. Sinner, come to Jesus Christ that you may have life in His name. Come and drink from the fountain of living water that He will give you. Don't bring your money. Leave your filthy rags, which are your works, behind and reach out instead with the empty hand of faith to receive from Christ's fullness. Come to Christ and beg of Christ like this Father implore Him, Lord Jesus, save my soul before I die. That brings us to the second doctrine slash application. Secondly, we see how God orchestrates crises to do sinners spiritual good. God organizes and ordains crises to do sinners spiritual good. This again is a theme. We'll see this in chapter 9. We'll see this in chapter 11 with Lazarus dying in which Jesus says to His disciples regarding Lazarus' death, He says this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And He says to them in verse 15, He says, for your sakes I was glad I was not there. Meaning when Lazarus died. He says, so that you might believe. That Christian is the lens through which we must read this account. This son's sickness was not random. It was not happenstance. It was decreed by an all-wise God to bring this household to Himself in saving faith in Christ. God could have prevented this son from even getting sick in the first place. Right? Exodus 4.11 Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I the Lord? It's the Lord that gives us the measure of health or lack of measure that He gives us. But this crisis was God's method of humbling this official and bringing him to a place where he sees his own helplessness and his dependence upon Christ. And through this, God turns this man to Christ. And that has profound application for both the Christian and the non-Christian. First of all, Christian, what a picture this passage is of the Christian's response of faith turning to the Lord in your afflictions. Just like this boy's illness, the afflictions of your life are calculated and decreed by the wisdom of God Almighty. They're not accidents. They're not momentary lapses of reason on God's part. He's decreed the afflictions you've already experienced and He's decreed the ones you are yet to experience. And if you could, from a a bird's eye view, see the whole tapestry that God is weaving that is your life, you would see how all of them, every last one of them, are working for your good. And heaven will be all the richer for you because of them. Right? You remember Paul's words to the Corinthians? This light momentary affliction is producing 
for us an eternal weight of glory. And Christian, learn now from this Father what your response is to be when God ordains these things. Like this Father fled to Christ for mercy, you are to flee to Christ in all of your trials and afflictions without delay. They are waves which smash us and drive us against the rock who is Christ. Go to Him again and again and again for help and for grace in your time of need and prove His benevolence to you. Prove His graciousness and His power, His pity, His tenderness. We, we sung this morning in that last hymn, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. That you would go to Him like this Father and plead again and again, Lord, give me grace. Give me help. I am a beggar. I'm struggling. I am weak. I am helpless. But Lord, You are strong and faithful and gracious. And so pour out Your pity upon me as You did upon this Father. And then, Christian, not only that, after you have applied to Christ for help, watch for answered prayer. Resign yourself to the Word of Christ and watch for His answer. Just like this Father inquired into the precise way in which Christ healed His Son, you, Christian, take note and pay attention and store up in your memory all the ways that Christ relieved your distress or gave you grace to endure the affliction so that like this Father, you can tell others what the Lord has done for your soul. Christian, how we need to cling to the Word of Christ. The Word of Christ is the anchor for our souls. It is the only thing that is sure and stable when we are tossed and battered and drug under by the waves of of affliction. When these things come, we are not to take the counsel of our own feelings or the counsel of our own present reasonings and interpretations of providence, but we hold tight to what Christ has said because we know what He has said is true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will never pass away. And He has told us that of all whom the Father has given to Him, He will lose none. He has told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Unbeliever, take note of this. There are two very different directions the afflictions of God might drive you. The first direction is the direction that it drove this Father and it turned Him towards the Lord. To look to the Lord and to depend on the Lord. But the other direction is that the afflictions God God brings to you can drive sinners away from the Lord. And sinners respond instead by hardening their heart and, and blaming God and being angry with God. Don't go that way. Here's the truth. Nothing God does to you is unfair. In fact, everything everything you think that God has done to you that you think is unfair is actually peppered with mercies that you don't even recognize. And all of those things could have indeed been far worse than they were. Non-Christian afflictions and crises are sent by the hand of God to turn your attention to the Lord. And what feels to you like a heavy hand of judgment is actually God graciously wounding you and reproving you for trying to go it alone without the Lord so that you might come to your senses and turn to Him. The the mercies and kindnesses of God are meant to lead you to repentance and so are His judgments. 
Because His judgments now warn us of a much, seri- much more serious judgment that is coming if you don't turn to Christ. Christian, let us recognize this truth when our believe- unbelieving friends and family experience the afflictions of the curse. Right? Like this Father, it's right for us to have sorrow and pity and to weep with those who weep. But also, let us not cease to pray, Lord, this is hard. But Lord, may You use this to turn them to Yourself. May You use this to make them a trophy of Your grace and to humble them and bring them to the cross of Christ. That brings us to the third thing. Third thing. Lastly, we are instructed in the long suffering of Christ to do sinners good. We are instructed in the long suffering of Christ to do sinners good. This is something that can be easily missed, I think, in this text. I already alluded to it briefly, and I want to point it out to you. Verse 46 So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water wine. Verse 54. This again is the second sign Jesus did when He had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, remember, what do we know about these Galileans? We know that by and large, they are a people who are infatuated with Jesus' signs because they saw Him at the feast, they heard about the wedding at Cana, and yet according to verse 44, which we looked at last time, they do not honor Christ as their prophet. That's why He says to them in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Here's the thing. Christ knew that about them before He came here. He knew He was going into His home country where He would not be honored as a prophet. And yet, He continues to minister amongst them. He continues to shine the light before them. And He perseveres in His mission to gather in His sheep. And like the Samaritan woman, this official and his household were among those that He must bring in. And likewise, Christian, we are called to imitate Christ in this. I want to exhort us, I want to exhort myself and all of us We are called to imitate Christ in persevering in being faithful even to those who have previously, perhaps many times, rejected the truth. In fact, we might say that there is a particular application for persevering especially with those that we are closest to. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And yet, Jesus tarries with them again and again. We'll get to John chapter 7 in some time where even Jesus' own half-brothers are mocking Him because they do not believe in Him. And yet, He does not write them off. Christian, persevere in faithful witness to those who have previously rejected you and rejected the Gospel. The prophet Isaiah In Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6 is that great chapter where he sees the Lord high and lifted up and he is officially uh, sent on his mission. And God sends Isaiah on a mission to continue speaking to those who will not hear. And to go on speaking to those who will not see. And Isaiah asks the Lord, how long, O Lord? And the divine reply is until I bring judgment upon them. Just keep going, Isaiah. Just keep going. In many ways, the ministry of the Lord Jesus was just like that. And in many ways, our ministry is just like that. Speaking to people, family, friends, co workers, who do not want to listen. And yet we persevere. And I recognize that there are occasions where we have to obey the Lord's command to not cast our pearls before swine. When, When someone becomes so violently 
opposed to the truth that it's no longer wise to engage with them. But honestly, if we're honest, more often our struggle is not with persevering too long with people, but our struggle is not persevering long enough with them. And just throwing in the towel too soon. Writing them off. And I really think on Judgment Day, we would rather give an account for being too patient with sinners than to give an account for being too impatient. We need to pray for grace. Paul said to Timothy, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Am I willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Can we endure another round of ridicule and rejection and hostility for the sake of the elect who we don't know but God knows and for all we know may be amongst this group of people? Jesus did that and He saw a Samaritan revival. He sees here an official and his family come to faith. Paul sees the heart of Lydia opened. The Philippian jailer and his radical conversion. And countless others because they persevered even though they had been rejected. Perhaps it's time for us to take inventory again of where our hearts are at. Have we become callous? Have we become stingy with extending pity to sinners? Christ was long-suffering, brothers and sisters, until literally His last moments on the cross when He looked into the eyes of the thief who just moments before was mocking Him and jeering Him, and when that man said to the Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus' gracious reply to Him was, today you will be with Me in paradise. Christian, as long as sinners have breath in their lungs, there is hope. And it should be our disposition that if the most hardened sinner who has rejected us for years, year after year, and they have wronged us, and they have mocked us, and they have rejected us, if God suddenly does a work of grace in their heart and they turn to the Lord, it should be our joy and crown to gladly receive them and rejoice in the mercy of God. Brothers and sisters, let us not cease to do sinners good Let us love sinners as Christ has loved us with an everlasting, persevering love. And may we be His disciples in the world who reflect His character and His glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that You would write Your Word upon our hearts. Father, cause us to learn to go more deeply into the glories of Emmanuel, God with us. Father, how we look forward to entering Emmanuel's land, the land of life, the land where there is no death and decay, no more struggle with sin, where the Lamb is all the glory. Father, produce within us a greater longing to be with Christ. Produce in us a greater longing to be conformed to Christ so that we would be better fitted for the enjoyment of heaven. Father, work on us. Continue the work of our sanctification. We pray that we would look to Christ in our afflictions. Cause us to prove Him over and over, our great High Priest, the One who pities us because He has been tempted in every way like we have, and yet He was without sin. And He has run the race that was set before Him, and He has entered His glory, and He has sat down at Your right hand. And we know that because He can never fail, we can never fail to reach glory. Father, strengthen the weak in heart among us. Those who are struggling with sin, those who are burdened, those who are 
weighed down by the ever-remaining presence of our iniquity and our failures. Father, show to them through your word a gracious Christ who meets us where we are. Show to them a gracious Christ who does not make conditions that we must meet in order to come to him, but we simply need to feel our need of him. Father, we pray that you would help us, those of us who are struggling in the fight of faith and evangelism. We pray that like the woman at the well, like this father, this nobleman, that we would be eager to share Christ. Lord, cause us to be astounded at the wonder of Christ's person and work. Cause our hearts to be full so that they overflow with His glories. Father, do all these things for Your name's sake. We pray that You would give us greater measures of Your Holy Spirit. Build us up in the faith. We pray for our time of fellowship together in between services today. Pray that You would help us as a church to encourage one another in the Lord. Cause us to do good to one another. Cause us to instruct and admonish and counsel and learn so that all of us together might grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Grow into maturity so that we might be those who discern that will which is good and pleasing to You, Father. Draw near to us, we pray. Bless our afternoon service. Pray that You'd be with our brother Thaddeus. Be merciful to him and instruct our people and strengthen us even as we consider church history and we consider the long line of saints who have gone before us upon whose shoulders we stand. Cause us to be thankful and to be deeply rooted in the truths of Your Word as they've been handed down from one generation to the next. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.